Um, today we are in the book of John, and I'm going to read the words of Jesus found in chapter 16, verse 7. Look at it on the screen. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Friends, this is God's word, and I cling to the belief that it is true. Would you pray with me one more time? God, we lift up this time in your word to you. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather in your presence, to lift high your name, and to worship you. And so, God, we just pray that you would open our hearts to hear what it is you have for us from your scripture today. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Jake Barnett was what you would call a child prodigy. By the time he turned eight, he was getting pretty bored of third grade. And he began begging his parents to allow him to learn about something he was actually interested in, like algebra. And to keep Jake occupied, his parents allowed him to actually audit an evening mathematics course at a local college, the Purdue University of Indianapolis. And to everyone's surprise, when, the Jake, when Jake took the final exam of this course he was auditing, at the end of the semester, he got an A. At the age of 10, Jake was then invited to attend the university full-time, and so he dropped out of fifth grade and went to college. And just to prove that he was ready for college, he taught himself all of high school math in two weeks. Developing an interest in theoretical physics, Jake co-authored a research paper on PT symmetric lattice systems, which was featured in Physical Review A, making him the youngest person ever to be published in, the, in this prestigious physics journal at the age of 12. By age 13, he started work on his master's degree in quantum physics, and at 15 was accepted as a theoretical physicist researcher at the Perimeter Uni Institute. Jake's memory has always been remarkable, with one Ohio State professor saying that his ability to recall information is 1 in 10 million. With an IQ of 170, Jake's intelligence rivals that of even Albert Einstein. Jake Barnett is certainly an extraordinary individual. But what makes Jake's story and his uh, ability so even more amazing is that no one could have imagined that Jake would even make it to college at all. You see, just before his second birthday, Jake began to regress, exhibiting strange behavior like avoiding eye contact and not speaking. After his parents consulted with several doctors, he was diagnosed with moderate to severe autism. But even though he was struggling in so many areas of his life, his parents quickly saw him doing extraordinary things in other areas, such as memorizing maps, complex maps, and reciting the ABCs backwards. They found that the more he focused on subjects he loved, like math and science, the more he began to communicate. And though he still struggled socially, he began to take off exponentially in academics. And before you knew it, he was performing at a genius level. In an interview with 60 Minutes, Jake was asked about how he sees his autism. My autism, he responded, is the reason that I believe I am in college and am so successful. My autism is the reason I love math and science and astronomy. My autism is the reason why I care. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten this far. And for all practical purposes, Jake's probably right. In fact, st studies have shown that there is and seems to be a strong correlation between autism and genius. Although autism didn't, get, didn't start getting diagnosed until the 1980s, there is quite a bit of speculation that there have been, you know, that some of the world's most brilliant people to have ever lived could have been or were likely autistic. 
People think that Albert Einstein was probably autistic. Sir Isaac Newton, Nikola Tesla. There's speculation that Bill Gates might have a little bit of autism. Elon Musk claims to have some sort of Asperger's or autism. All these people have shown these characteristics that are commonly associated with the disorder, such as avoiding eye contact and antisocial behavior. But what seems very likely is that these quirks are part of actually what has helped propel them to genius. What most would call a disadvantage is actually an incredible advantage. Or to give you another example, I'm guessing this is the right crowd to tell this story to. I was listening to a comedian talk about his uncle who has Down syndrome. And he says, you know, it's kind of funny. You can kind of tell who's never been around Down syndrome before when you bring up that you have a relative with it. Because uh, they'll kind of look at you and go, oh, I'm sorry. Is he okay? And he's like, he's doing great. <laughs> he's doing better than anyone you know, right? There's just something about the fun-loving nature that is such a blessing to so many people. We've experienced it in our own church, obviously, through Denny. So just a beautiful Beautiful depiction, though, of how what you would think would be a disadvantage or a disability is actually, in so many ways, a real advantage. And, you know, we have been cruising right along in our series called The Upper Room, in which we have been looking at Jesus' last words to his disciples before his death on the cross. And some of the things he says to us have been comforting and encouraging, while other things have been, quite frankly, a little bit troubling and disturbing. And if you were here last week, what we talked about was more on the troubling and disturbing side of things. Jesus warns his disciples, and ultimately you and I today, that if we genuinely follow him, we will be hated by the world. Specifically, the world will hate Christians because the world hates Jesus because Jesus exposes sin. He wants his followers, Jesus wants his followers to be prepared for persecution. As he, brings, as he begins chapter 16, I have said these things to you, to keep you from falling away. If you're caught off guard by opposition, if you don't count the cost of following Christ, you will understandably be tempted to fall away when opposition arises. When things begin to hit the fan, you might lose your faith. So you might, uh, so you might have left last week a little bit discouraged especially as you perhaps thought about the times in your life when you have been rejected or mocked or slandered because of your belief in Jesus. Or for me, I was convicted about the so many times that I uh, haven't stood up to my faith because I was afraid of being hated by the world. What's really powerful is that in the midst of this conversation about persecution, Jesus points us back to something, or should I say someone, that he has talked about before. Consider chapter 15, verse 26. After telling us that the world has hated him without cause, and that in his physical absence the world will hate his disciples, he says this, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Life is going to get difficult. It's going to be out of the frying pan and into the fire once Jesus ascends into heaven. But as he has told us before, we don't need to worry because help is on the way. Jesus is going to send to us a helper. And for you and I, he has sent the helper, the, the Holy Spirit. What is perhaps the most remarkable part about the helper's presence is that Jesus isn't sending in a bench warmer to fill his place. <clears throat> He's not calling a sixth man to fill the role of the star player. No. Jesus makes the case to his disciples and to you and I that the best is yet to come. So let's look at his shocking words together. Again, we're in John chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, you can open there. And let's start by reading verse 4. John 16, verse 4. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So for what feels like the hundredth time, Jesus tells us that he's leaving, that he is going. And apparently no one cares <laughs> where he's going to. Je None of you ask me, where are you going, Jesus says. But hold on, time out for a second. Because is this true? Is this really a true statement by Jesus? In chapter 13, verse 36, Peter asks Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And then in 14.5, Thomas pipes up and says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Where are you going? We don't know how to get there. And so it seems, for all practical purposes, that his disciples have asked Jesus where he is going. So why does Jesus claim that they haven't? Well, this is a difficult question to answer in many ways, but here's an explanation that I read that I found actually pretty helpful. So let's say that a father is taking his son to a baseball game. He's been promised him, hey, we're going to go to this game. They've been looking forward to it for the past month or so, getting really excited for the game. But right before they are going to leave, the father gets called away to an emergency meeting of some kind and he can no longer attend. And in response to this, the son asks his dad, Ah, oh, Dad, where are you going? Now, in that moment, I think we would all agree that the son doesn't actually care where the father's going. Right? He could be meeting with the president. <laughs> he could be dealing with some sort of crisis with a, helping some poor family out. He could be doing anything. It wouldn't matter. The son would still be disappointed. In reality, what the child is asking is not, where are you going, but why are you leaving me? That's what the child cares about most in that moment. Why are you leaving me? And in the same way, I think we could agree that the disciples aren't truly asking thoughtful questions about where Jesus is going and what it means for them, but rather in this moment they are distraught and quite frankly self-absorbed by their own personal loss. As Jesus points out, at the sound of him saying these things, their so sorrow has filled their hearts. They're so focused on the fact that they are not going to be with Jesus anymore, that they're going to lose Jesus, that they can't see the forest for the trees. Which is why it must have been so shocking for them, and really it's extremely shocking for you and I today, when Jesus says in verse 7, that I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Whoa, Jesus, say that again. I don't think I heard you right. You need to clear up my ears a little bit. You said it's to our disadvantage that you're leaving, right? It's to our advantage? What are you talking about? How could that be? And, and I mean, doesn't that seem like a bizarre thing for us to think about? Like how many of you here would give your left leg to be with Jesus in physical presence? To be with him in the flesh, right? To sit around a campfire with him. To hear him teach. To hear him talk about life. To be able to, to ask him questions. Right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's such an incredible thing to think about. In fact, that's what we're looking forward to when we go to heaven is just being in the physical presence of Christ. So why in the world does Jesus say it is to your advantage that I go away? Well, he goes on to explain. He says, for if I do not go away... The Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So it is to your advantage that Jesus leaves because his ascension marks the advent, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Helper. Upon returning to the Father, the Son sends the Spirit. So with this in mind, for the rest of our time, I want us to focus on this question. How does the Helper help? How does the Helper help? How is the presence of the Holy Spirit to the, to the Christian's advantage, even more so than Jesus' physical presence would be? 
That's what we're going to wrestle with today. So let's keep reading to find out. Look at verse 8 in your Bibles. And when he comes. Okay, hold on, time out. We'll just stop there for a second. And when he comes. Let's think about that statement for a second. When the Holy Spirit arrives, when the Holy Spirit comes, where? Where does he arrive? Where does the Holy Spirit arrive to? Where does he reside? Well, of course, on a larger scale, we could say that he resides, resides in the world as a whole. But I, think, but I want you to think about Jesus' promise back in chapter 14, verse 17. He says that the Father will send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, that you know, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Spirit dwells with you and in you. And so that's the first advantage of his advent. That the Spirit of God lives within your heart. Quite frankly, Jesus, when he was in the flesh, had limited influence. In the sense that he could teach through his words, and he could lead through his example. But ultimately, those things were external. Granted, he changed the world, right, by doing so. But he was still, by choice, right, limited in this way. However, the Holy Spirit's influence is not external, but is internal. The internal influence is intense because he can access the very core of your thinking and of your emotions. By indwelling the believer, the Spirit is able to work in some pretty powerful ways, a couple of which we've touched on earlier in this series. For instance, the Spirit illuminates the Word of God, helping the Christian understand the deeper meaning behind the text. Another way is through inspiration, leading you and I uh, by guiding us as we navigate difficult situations. Right? This could be by giving you peace during a time that would normally be very stressful, or bringing to mind an appropriate scripture when you're trying to counsel someone in a difficult situation. Needless to say, the very fact that the Spirit has come and lives within your heart is a profound advantage. A profound advantage to us. But there is another advantage as well. Look at verse 8 again. Uh, he says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged so the next advantage of the holy spirit is that he convicts the world now on the surface this is probably you know something that doesn't seem like an advantage right who in their right mind wants to be convicted <laughs> about something. Like, oh, it's to my advantage that I'm a convicted criminal, right? That's not something that we normally think of as a good thing. Why should we celebrate the helper convicting the world? Well, thankfully, Jesus tells us why. He points out to us that the Spirit convicts in three unique ways. He convicts concerning sin, he convicts concerning righteousness, and he convicts concerning judgment. So first, he convicts the world concerning sin. As Jesus says in verse 9, he convicts concerning sin because they do not believe. Remember, in the Gospel of John, that term, the world, is by and large a very negative term. When Jesus talks about the world, he means all of the people and all of their activities that are in willful rebellion against God. And in chapter 15, Jesus talked about how the world hates him because he exposes sin. Now, in chapter 16, he says that the Spirit will serve a similar role, namely that of convicting unbelieving people of their sins. Why does the Spirit do this? Because he is loving and gracious. Those of the world, those who do not have a relationship with Christ, are walking in the way of destruction. They are literally on a highway to hell, right? They are on their way to eternal separation from God. And at the moment that they are doing this, they do not recognize that they are in need of a Savior. They do not recognize their need to be saved. So what the Spirit does is convict a person of their sin in the hopes that their heart will be softened so they turn to Jesus for help and for hope. 
Once a person recognizes their need of a Savior, their need for a Savior, they can receive a Savior, the Savior, Jesus. The Spirit convicts men and women of their sin so they would turn to Christ and believe in Him and thereby stop being of the world. Some of you have experienced this conviction of sin by the Spirit firsthand. And I believe and I guarantee that if you were to come up here and talk to us, all of you would say that it is to your advantage that the Spirit convicted you of sin. It is to your advantage. But he doesn't just convict the sin of those who are obviously far, of God, far from God. Because the Spirit also convicts the world of righteousness. Verse 10. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. So if you know like the basics of Jesus' ministry, you know that the group of people that Jesus probably butted the heads with the most, the group of people that Jesus irritated the most was who? Pharisees, right? Those are the people that Jesus would confront again and again, right? The reason that they did not like him is because Jesus pointed his finger at them and said, hey, you guys are hypocrites. You guys are self-righteous. Time and time again. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, Jesus says to them on one occasion. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Right? Jesus called out their brutal judgment of people that they called sinners, saying that they were the ones who were actually sinful, right? Hey, you guys are the ones who have this sin in your heart, this self-righteous judgment. Because no amount of good works will save a person, no matter how righteous they appear. As the prophet Isaiah famously said, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. A part of Jesus' earthly ministry was to proclaim loud and clear the uselessness of works-based righteousness. But since he has ascended to the Father, the Spirit now takes on that role. The Spirit is the one who calls out self-righteousness. The Spirit is now the one who calls out unfair, brutal judgment. Now, the third way, though, that the Spirit convicts the world is actually himself through judgment. Concerning judgment, verse 10, because the ruler of the world is judged. Again, what Jesus, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he was often misjudged by people, especially the Pharisees, as we talked about. As he admonished them in John 7, do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. The way they saw Jesus was incorrect in that they did not recognize him as the Messiah. And even today, we know that people judge Jesus wrongly all the time. This could be because, as we talked about last week, they have created a Jesus of their own imaginations, right? A Jesus that's safe and comfortable, and doesn't call out sin. So they've misjudged him in that way. Or maybe they've just rejected him by not thinking that he is who he said he was, the Son of God, but not believing or trusting in him. And the reason why people have fallen into this false judgment is because they have been influenced by the ruler of the world. And who is the ruler of the world? Satan. Satan. The devil. As Jesus tells us, the devil is a liar and the father of lies. He has deceived people by distorting their judgment. And for this, he stands condemned. He himself will be judged. And again, this is good news, right? This is good news. Jesus condemns the devil by triumphing over him on the cross. And when he returns at the second coming, the devil will be defeated once and for all. And the Spirit will then carry on convicting the world of its false judgment, a judgment which is influenced by its insidious ruler. The Spirit's advent is advantageous because he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But there's one more advantage that Jesus tells, about, tells us about. Look at verse 12. <clears throat> verse 12, he says this, um, Still I have many things to say to you, But you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, 
for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that I, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So Jesus tells his disciples that he has more to say and that he has more to explain, but he can't simply do it. He can't do it anymore. Why? Because it would just be too much for his disciples to bear. Because these poor guys are still trying to wrap their heads around the fact that, they're, that Jesus is leaving them. Right? They're still trying to figure that part out. At this point, further teaching from him would not be helpful because these disciples, they simply could not take it all in. But at a later time, post-death and post-resurrection, they will be able to understand. They will be able to see what's going on here. And that's where the presence of the Spirit will be very advantageous. Because Jesus says that the Helper will guide you into all truth. He will take what is mine, verse 15, and declare it to you. Now what does this mean? What does this mean? Does this mean that the Spirit tells all Christians all truth at all times? Because anything directly spoken of God is technically revelation, right? Meaning that it is authoritative and inspired in the same way that the Bible is. And the problem with that is that this is, you know, there's been more than one cult leader who has claimed to be guided by the Spirit into the truth and has really misled people. No, what I, I don't think this means that the Spirit will tell all Christians absolutely everything about all there is to know. That's not what I think this means. Rather, what I believe Jesus is saying here is that the Helper will interpret to the disciples specifically the meaning of, and the significance of his death, resurrection, and exaltation. The Spirit is the one who inspires the gospel writers, right? The Apostle Paul, the writer of Hebrews, James, and John. He's the one who inspires the writing of the New Testament, which we read today to help us grasp the meaning of what Christ has done. Ultimately, the spirit, the, the, excuse me, the truth that the Spirit will lead these disciples into, and really us into, is a complete understanding of the good news of the gospel. Because right now, the disciples they only see things in part, right? They don't understand the full miracle of grace. They don't see with full understanding that Jesus will die for their sins on the cross so that they can be raised to new life with Him. They don't understand that part yet. They haven't grasped that yet. They don't quite have a full understanding of the gospel. The gospel, as it's outlined to us in the book of Romans, right? The Romans road. The gospel, as it's described to us in John 3, 16. The gospel, as it's played out in the book of Revelation, will be revealed by the Spirit, guiding the disciples into all truth. Through Jesus, the gospel is embodied. Through the Spirit, the gospel is understood. Praise be to God for such an advantage. Praise be to the Holy Spirit for revealing to his disciples and revealing to us the words of life as they are found in the New Testament. The Spirit has guided us into all truth. What a glorious advantage that is. So with this in mind, my closing thought to you is simply this. Will you take advantage of this advantage? Will you take advantage of this advantage? If you're listening to this, whether you're here or you're online, um, and you haven't given your life to Christ, you haven't made the decision to follow after Jesus, will you take advantage of the Spirit convicting you of sin? Will you hear the Lord calling to you, pointing out that you are a sinner in need of a Savior? And all the more, will you recognize that you need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus? Will you take advantage of the Spirit convicting you of sin? Or if you are a believer, will you take advantage of His indwelling in your heart? How often do we forget the powerful person who lives inside of us? As Paul says in Romans 8, 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give, you, give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Because the Spirit of the living God dwells within you, Christian, you can walk in newness of life with Him. 
and through him. You don't have to live a life that's enslaved to sin. You're free in Christ. When you face a problem, you don't carry that burden alone. You can bring your burdens to him, and he will give you the peace of God, which transcends understanding. And of course, are you taking advantage of the gospel clarity that is given to us in his word? Are you growing and abiding in the truth of Scripture? Are you taking advantage of something that the disciples at the moment of this passage did not have? Something that they did not possibly understand. There is incredible power that is found in the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who lives within your heart. Believe it or not, it is in fact to your advantage that Jesus is not with us because now we have the helper. Praise be to God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit for such an incredible advantage. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that it's to our advantage that you left us that you are ruling and reigning in heaven, and that you sent your Holy Spirit to dwell within our hearts to help us, to guide us, to lead us. God, we praise you for such a wonderful advantage. God, may we take advantage of this gift and advantage that you have given to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.